Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to TNO, the last states of Europe, in which we're playing as, not Africa, but as a good old USA. Uh, last time we got involved in South Africa, and we unfortunately lost Mr. Milhouse Nixon, but now we have Mr. JFK, because nothing bad could ever happen to the Kennedys, no. Kennedys will be great, forever great, but we have the fall of Windhoek. Today, the Africa Shield suffers a serious blow. Despite constant aerial bombings from increasingly desperate defenders, the South African army, supported by an element of the OFN coalition, has taken Windhoek, administrative center of Reich Commissariat of Sudwest Africa, after almost a day of furious fighting. A central compound of the colonial government was the last sector of the city to fall, as almost 200 soldiers, supported by a battalion of the native SS, had bunkered in the already heavily fortified building forcing the American troops to clear the underground corridors and booby-trapped halls with flamethrowers and military engineers. The last weeks had seen combined Allied troops inflict defeat after defeat against the Reichskommissariat, steadily gaining ground against a weakened and demoralized opponent. But this might be the turning point of the war, with the fall of Windhoek. The shield has lost its largest airfields, and large supplies, fuel, and airplane parts that have also been seized by the attackers before the Germans could retreat. Uh... Reichskommissar? Uh, that doesn't seem right, but Reichskommissar Schenk has managed to flee the city on his personal fighter, and in his first statement, he has sworn to bring back the German flag to Windhoek. But with the Western Front in disarray, and shield troops still retreating, many doubt whether he'll be able to keep faith to his word. And the war yet will go on, and we have the tears of a continent. The man from Angola climbed the staircase two steps at a time. Surprised he hadn't been stopped yet. At the top, you would find the office of the man they called Mr. Yao Kennedy, the American king or prime minister of whatever they had. The big boss, anyway. There it was. He would, he'd be able to please case, and perhaps they could help. A young man stepped out of the office and looked up at the Angolian Angolan with surprise. Sorry, he said, but you just can't walk in there. Was this John Kennedy? He tried to remember the lines he'd practiced in the mirror. Excuse me, are you Zhao Kennedy? The white man looked at him with a furrowed brow. I'm his chief of staff, Robert. What is this about? Who are you? The Angolan struggled to remember the right words in English. I uh, am Angolan. I come here to America because of the Germans. It caused much uh, suffering. Since I come back, I ask for help for Angola, as all say America is for freedom, but nobody lets me speak. I want to speak to Zhao Kennedy for my people. Robert Kennedy had heard about the killings in Angola. The Germans had been slaughtering people all over the world for 20 years, and people had been desensitized to it. But he thought, maybe it was worth trying. Even if they only saved a few people, surely it was worthwhile. Surely he had a duty to convince his brother. Kennedy smiled at the Angolan. Well, you sure don't have to have an appointment, but why don't you come on in? I'm sure we can spare a few minutes for your concerns. We must clean up at home first. You know what? If we can make the world a bit, just a bit better, then we should. And we have our next focus as well. So, I remember a couple... Reach out to progressives. There's a, when we get to the point after the election with, hopefully, RFK, um, someone wants me to sideline the Dixiecrats if, as fast as possible, so we'll see what we can do. Now, I'll be honest here. These look great. You know, like, bring back the NPP, One Nation, Indivisible... Uh, and the rolling wake of change, the eagle soars, but, uh, <laughs> man, where we're going, oh, man, I don't know, let's see, I want to make sure that, ooh, we could get pensions, but, um, I want to make sure that the NPP gets even more popular or unified, so, and the rolling wake of change isn't bad, uh, stability isn't bad either, political power, conservative, liberal democracies, Republican, Democrats look better, American society grows a little more unified, one last chance, if I can do this one, that'd probably be good, so reach out to progressives, uh, Richard Dix Dixiecrats, but we'll mend the rifts first. Richard Nixon was not a polite or uncompromising or compromising nature, a trait which did little to unite the nation in one of the most contentious periods in the history of the U U.S. John Kennedy, however, draw support from almost every corner of American politics. With a little help from some bipartisan allies and a few unifying words, Kennedy might just be able to mend the social and political rifts that Nixon carved. Cool, and we're still down here, so, honestly, I was able to, or we were able to, really get a second division here, which means it's it's not going to be that difficult doing this. So, there we go. Let's go to another division. But we still cannot push that hard here. Because I will wait until after the election to finish this war up. And are we still campaigning? Let's see, improve relations? No. No. Nah. Uh, the American society is united with some benefit, which will in benefit incumbent presidents and weaken extremists. Alright, cool. A solid MPP campaign. Great. Great work, everyone. Mm, you know what, we don't, we don't need to see that either, because we we got to see this. So the next area we're going to do to influence will probably be either the southwest. Probably the southwest. Wow. The MPP is doing very, very well. Southwest. Or Rockies. I and mean, that's just pretty much it. We could do more of this stuff, but I still want to save some more political power up. The domestic situation. Nah, we're good. Somewhat low discontent. And honestly, if it's looking like this for now... Then we're probably shooing for the elections, so. 
Really not too worried about it. Man, the refs. Great. Men, the refs of America. And Lozano elected president of Mexico. Cool. And we'll reach out to progressives first. The progressives of the Republican Party have held a very prominent role in American history, but their inclusion into the mainstream Republican platform have always been a tenuous one. More than a few have become fed up with the party as a whole and walked across the aisle to the center NPP. J president JFK knows and understands that if the Republicans fail to rally themselves on major issues, most progressives who still align themselves with the party will flock to the NPP. If the president is to get his plans in motion, the progressives must stand behind him. And get a whole 1% more in terms of uh, liberal democracy. Uh, I guess we'll take that, just so that we can not get these guys encircled. Oh yeah, these guys are still struggling, that's fine. Go Bobbis. Go Bobbis. Uh, so, oh, the polls are updated, great. Let's check in on the horse race polls. Uh, okay, so there's a couple comments from yesterday. I know, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter at all. So actually, someone recommend I actually increase construction spending. You know what, if you guys say it, I'll probably will. I'll probably do that thing, so. We still have a good deficit. This way we can build ourselves up a little bit more. And I, and I know debt doesn't matter. I know it doesn't matter. Look at one, two, three, four, five, six. But, man. Uh, what? Okay. Nothing bad happens to the Kennedys. No, never. Never. Well then, um, JFK has just been assassinated. JFK, the newly inaugurated president of the U.S., smiled and waved to the crowd from the motorcade driving him through downtown Dallas, accompanied by Governor John Connolly of Texas and their wives. Kennedy was enjoying the cool breeze through his hair and the adoration of the onlookers. He was already more popular than Nixon and achieved significant success at calming the nation after Nixon's um, ignominious fall from grace. Connolly turned to the president, commenting that nobody could say all of Dallas didn't love him. No, replied the president, flashing the governor his winning smile. You certainly can't. As he turned his back to the crowd and he heard a certain... Heard a sudden blast, and his head blew apart, showering his wife with blood. Just as the dust settled, two bodies were brought into the city morgue. The president's and that of a young black man shot dead by Officer J.D. Tippett while attempting to steal a card gunpoint. He was later identified as Martin Joseph Henry, a Guyanese immigrant who worked as a custodian in the Dallas County Courthouse. Police investigating the courthouse found a Carcano rifle stash in a fourth floor maintenance closet, and several show casings were found by a window overlooking the stretch of road where the president was, sh was shot. A search of his apartment also revealed a motive. Henry was a fervent Guyanese nationalist, and he felt he had to stop American hegemony over his no home nation at any cost. As Speaker of the House and acting Vice President of John McCormick prepared to take the oath of office, America slowly coming to grips with his tragedy just after wrapping their heads around the reality of Nixon's resignation. People are nervous for the future, both their own and that of their nation, but no matter how bleak it may seem, there is a sense that American people will have to pick up those pieces and soldiers on as they always have. If not us, then who? Ooh. Ooh. Po political power, recruitable population factor, stability, war support, American society grows much further divided. Uh, ooh, actually, we can complete this one. We can reach out to progressives just to get a little bit more liberal democracy for now. Uh, let's see, liberal democracy. Wait, let's. That is liberal democracy. So we get a little bit more support from McCormick. Uh, George Wallace. I don't want to lose that much political power, stability, and stuff, so I don't want to do that yet. I'm going to reach out to progressives. No, no, JFK is not dead yet. I swear to God, he's not dead. <laughs> just don't show the bodies. Don't, don't, don't show the footage, man. Don't show those pictures. Put everyone in. Dallas under, like, martial law right now. <laughs> I swear he's okay. Okay. And once the focus is done, we can we can go ahead. Okay, we can do it. If not us, then who? Oh, JFK. Ah, oh, why? Why? Well, he's still on the thumbnail for this episode, so. And we have John McCormick, who I've never heard of. So. Speaker of the House. Oh, that's cool, though. All right, the McCormick presidency, a president in disgrace, another president shot dead, a country in chaos, an election barely a year away. To say that the situation of the Republican Democrats is dire would be the understatement of the century. Enter former Speaker of the House John McCormick, uh, who a man who never expected to hold the reins of power who has, regardless, found them thrust into his hands. At such a dark moment in America's history, McCormick will certainly have his work cut out for him. With the election approaching, McCormick's tenure as president will be short. He has no intentions of running in the election, instead he's simply, simply resolving to hold the Oval Office for the coming months until a new commander-in-chief can be nominated. However, with his party in shambles and the National Progressive Party making unprecedented gains, he tends to use his brief tenure to try and right the ship and save the Republican Democrats from ruin. The tarnished legacy of Nixon will need to be addressed, a matter President Kennedy was unable to attend to in his tragically brief rule. The fallout of the South Africa war that Nixon thrust the country into will need to be carefully managed as well. If McCormick can successfully put out the flames that his party is currently engulfed in and restore some semblance of dignity to the government, the Republican Democratic Party may just survive and pull through, or at the very least, survive absolute electoral decimation. But don't we want that? Hmm. All right, let's go to the Rockies next, because we can. Yeah, Rockies. It's still a toss-up, for the House at least. Uh, the Great Plains are pretty much NPP-aligned, with a little bit of mix in there. And then we'll do the Southwest next, probably. 
Oh, a little bit of toss up in the East Coast too. Uh, things are actually looking a little bit more toss up. Not nearly as much as before, but yeah, not bad. East Coast, Delaware and Maryland. Delaware, Maryland, or Great Plains. And let's see. This is West Coast, New England, Central East Coast. Well, I, I assume they mean probably like Delaware, Maryland, but I bear provides mass for the war effort. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, oh, boy. There goes Hadrish. Well, Portuguese colonial administration over Mozambique and Gola is a thing of the past. Not more than a mention within the history books, the recency of this history has now the potential to pay dividends within the war effort. In a recent coordination effort hosted in Washington, hosted, Hosted. Senior members of the Iberian military provided to us a plethora of data maps and documentation, hailing from the era or late era of Portuguese colonial control in Mozambique and Angola. The content of the documents provide details at great length upon the industrial and infrastructural specifications in various vital regions within the countries, which are now controlled by the Rocks Commissariats of the Africa Shield. We estimate that the maps, while outdated, are likely to this day be accurate to a high degree. The information provided by the Iberians should prove invaluable for the continued effectiveness of the American bombing campaign against our enemies as we begin to accurately strike at vital enemy logistical and industrial centers. May the bombs rain down even more accurately than before. Cool. How are our plans? Because we don't have a lot of cast. We're slowly running out of cast here, which is not cool. But, you know, it is what it is. Cool in Scotland. The light finally goes out. Oh, boy. That's not good. Oh, there goes Speer. Oh, boy. Bye, Speer. Bye-bye. Gunship support, nice. And then we'll do some, uh, why not? We'll do some of this, too. Why not? And have a sip of coffee. And not try to spill it on my stuff. Oh, goodness. Uh oh. Cool. Air task grounds. And then we will do uh, this one, which should be good. And then we shall do maybe some more support, maybe. Maybe. Logistics, your hospitals, uh, eh, let's get some maintenance companies. Uh, no, let's get some more weapons stuff if we can. It is 64, so I will be right back. All right, my apologies about that, but I wanted to double check to make sure that uh, I didn't spill too much coffee. But anyways, uh, it wasn't that much, just a, just, just a tiny bit. But anyways, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, I have no idea who this person is. McCormick? I have no idea. But the McCormick presidency, the burden of power. McCormick never wanted this. His career had been most successful, for sure. He had always wanted to serve his country and the party, and in his tenure as Speaker of the House, he had performed admirably, if he did say so himself. Then Nixon lied and Kennedy died, and suddenly this Boston-born son of a hog carrier found himself thrust into the highest office in the land. The days seemed to be blurred together as he struggled to gather himself. The Oval Office was a whirlwind of activity, endless lines of politicians and secretaries rushing to give him the lay of the land. More rioting in the South cried one. The latest casualty report from South Africa, Mr. President, said another. The podium at the press office or press conference was another beast. He lost count of the amount of times he had uttered all the phrases, as, national tragedy and difficult times for us all, in front of flashing cameras over the last few days. Finally, whenever he found himself at a brief moment to relax, he'd pick up the newspaper and read all about the grim poll forecast, then the endless rumor mill, and the countless reports of anti-war protests <clears throat> and continuing civil rights clashes and the lines of coffins returning from overseas. Man, we have not lost that many guys, I'll be honest. Like, we can double check, but probably not that many. One night, sleep truly eluded him. He found himself in the Oval Office, sitting in darkness, save only for the lights flooding in from his White House lawn. His presidency would not be a successful one. He accepted that. He made no plans to run an election to try and legitimize or extend his rule, but perhaps he could steady the nation well enough that who came after him could be within a shot of triumph. Stealing himself, the caretaker president prepared for the ordeal ahead. That's kind of good. I mean, if I was in his position, be like, you know what? This is all screwed up. I can't do anything, do that much. So just do the best you can. You know, I mean, at some point, there's no point worrying about anything because there's not much you can do about it. Remain calm, though. The shock and uncertainty sparked by the wave of scandals and tragedies the party has experienced has not only shattered the public's confidence in us, it has also frayed the tenuous bonds that hold the various factions of the party together. With many of the Democrats and even a few Republican senators openly wondering if the continued existence of the United Party is beneficial to anyone, drastic action must be taken to pull the party together, if we are to ever have, of course, a hope of salvaging the election. President McCormick will need to wrangle the squabbling factions into presenting a united front against the chaos America finds itself in. Restoring party unity will be critical to allay the nation's panic and prevent a mass defection of voters from the Republican Democrats. A brother alone, despite his best efforts, RFK or Robert F. Kennedy, could not hold back his tears. He was supposed to give a big speech about his brother's legacy, about the strength and dedication of his character and how he was an example to all within the halls of power. That was true enough, but as he sat in the holding area, awaiting his cue, he could only think of John as a brother he looked up to. His greatest inspiration and his closest friend, he wondered if he should just call it off, so great was his grief. 
grief and anger. John was killed because he was the president. He was the, he was only president because of the Republican Democrats. Because of Nixon lying like a son of a gun and doing everything in his power to stop progress and change, killing the Civil Rights Act and forcing John to step up to the firing line in the most damnably literal way. The party chewed him up and spat him out. They had used him, just like they had used the entire Kennedy family to drag their name through the mud. When a staffer poked their head into the room to wave him on stage, Robert stilled his tears and prepared to give what would become one of the most shocking speeches of his career. After slowly ascending to the podium, he addressed the assembled crowd, giving a short but passionate eulogy in honor of his brother, extolling his candor, his way with words, his dedication to America. The crowd nodded along, some cried and some bowed their heads, but none of them could prepare for what came next. My brother was loyal to the Republican Democrats through and through. He was loyal as they made every effort to avoid bringing this country true equality and justice. He was loyal as they charged blindly into an unnecessary and bloody war in Africa. He was loyal as he was ignored until the time where they needed a man to clean up their mistakes, and he was loyal as a fallout of their ignorance resulted in the loss of his life. He paused as many in the crowds uh, stared agape. At least... At least two from the party mouth words of astonishment and curses at him. His next time would live on in infamy. I was loyal to the Republican Democrats also. That ends today. Hell hath no fury like a brother scorned. Oh boy, this is getting fun. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about JFK. I mean, that's, that's, that's just like, man, that's not cool. But, nah, this is getting interesting. Uh, we could, I could increase like the situation down here, but honestly, uh, maybe just a little bit. Maybe we'll do a little bit more. Maybe just increase discontent. Maybe just a little bit more. Civilian, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to be big spenders, big spenders. I could increase construction more, but we've already did it once. So, and I need to, I don't know, I don't want to spend that much more. So, oh, God. The U.S. Air Force hits Luanda Arms Factories. Following an exchange of information between the Iberian and American militaries, the USAF has been in possession of detailed information upon the logistical and industrial layout of the Africa Shield-controlled regions of Mozambique and Angola. The intelligence has not been left to waste. Yesterday afternoon, the Air Force bombers struck at industrial uh, centers within Luanda, where significant arms production has been undertaken for the duration of the conflict in South Africa. Due to information provided by Iberian intelligence, American bombs were able to fall with deadly accuracy upon essential edifices within the local industry, causing irre irreparable damages and bringing a significant share of arms production in the region to a complete halt. Due to the quick and devastating nature of the new American bombing campaign, it is hoped that by many senior officials that the productive capabilities of the Rex Commissariats will be significantly hindered for the duration of the conflict. Despite this, the overall effect of the reinvigorated American bombing campaign upon the overall effectiveness of the Africa Shield has yet to be determined. A significant blow to the enemy war machine. Ah, political power. And the work goes on. Red, white, and blue balloons have colonized the roof of the Republican Democrat Convention Hall, where, as a booming co commotion indi indicates, the party has come to decide who will be RD's next presidential candidate. Ignoring the no-hopers, the two frontrunners are Republican LBJ and Democrat Wallace Bennett, young men running all the way with LBJ and Bennett for America. Badges glare at each other through the wafing cigarette smoke. Of course, as it always has been since the Senate of Rome, the real decision making it takes place behind closed doors in a meeting room, far removed from the hurly-burly of the convention hall, where a handful of craggy, white-haired men smoke cigars and ponder which man would be more likely to play ball with the big dogs. As if they were going to get past Nixon's disgrace in the year of three presidents, they needed a candidate who would be able to galvanize the public and counter the suddenly powerful NPP. Puffing away, they made the decision who might govern the, the U.S. for the next four years, like they were deciding what to have for dinner. Oh, man. To be honest with you, I don't think it really matters. Um, I've heard Bennett is more of an economist, and LBJ, I have no idea. I know he wants the great like, the great society, uh, so, and eliminate poverty. So let's go with all the way with LBJ. Let's see what happens with him. So far, what we've seen, at least in my understanding and perspective of LBJ, is he's kind of like, he's kind of a, maybe a bully a little bit. So, we'll see what happens. Hopefully he doesn't win, though, just because, like I said in the last episode, I want a little uh, Robert here. A little Robert? That sounds really weird. <clears throat> we get 1.85 a day, and we're going to remain calm, but we're going to be saving Nixon's legacy, but we're going to heal a, na a healing a broken nation. With the party restored to some semblance of cohesion, we must now work to win back the American people. With confidence in the party so gravely damaged, President McCormick must move quickly to prove that we are still the best choice for a better American future. Through dedicated and clear-headed leadership, he will show the people that the Republican Democrats are capable of guiding the nation through the crisis or crises we find ourselves in. McCormick will also need to deal with the ascent NPP. We have taken full advantage of the crises facing us to rocket up the opinion polls. If the rise is to be halted, they will need to outmaneuver them in both words and policy, proving that we are truly the real option to carry America forward. Cool. Political power? A little bit more stability? Tonight on the news, with the election drawing nearer and Americans across the nation try to determine who, will select the, who they will select for the highest office in the land, we believe it is our duty here at WCCO to help the residents of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area to fulfill their civic duty. 
To that end, WCCO has offered the Re Republican Democratic Party, the National Progressive Party, and smaller third parties the chance to send a representative to come on and discuss the party's platform and how their candidate would serve the nation's best in the coming weeks to Election Day. One of the biggest issues facing the nation in the 64 election is civil rights. This is a hot button issue for the past few years and results in fire and acrimonious acrimonious debate within both the national parties and division between the North and South, conservative and liberal. Further fuel in the fire was given to the issue of civil rights with President Nixon's veto of the Civil Rights Act, torpedoing the major effort by Congress to solve the problem in a bipartisan manner. Joining us this evening is National Progressive Candidate and War Hero, Winfield S. Cunningham, for discussion regarding civil rights in America. So, Captain Cunningham, what is your view regarding the President's actions regarding vetoing the civil rights? Vetoing that thing was the only good decision Nixon never made. America needs to move forward to integration, not internal racial division. Mm. Oh, I don't know what to choose. I mean, I've, I've done this before once. I don't, I don't know if it really makes a difference. Mm. What's well, good to do with well, vetoing was the only thing he made? I don't know. We'll try that one out. New friends, MPP Center head was office was empty as Robert Kennedy entered. He helped himself to a seat and sat patiently as he waited for an indeterminate amount of time. He wondered if it was going to do if he wondered if he was going he was doing it. It was too much, or if anyone would take him seriously, given that he had been in an establishment stooge for so far too long, still he had to try. Finally, the door to the office swung open. In walked Scoop Jackson, closely followed by his underlings, Newberger and Harrington. The three regarded Kennedy cursely, yet hopeful, as he sat opposite of him, each shaking his hand in turn. Scoop was the first to speak. This is certainly unusual, but I hear good things about you, Mr. Kennedy. We have a few questions for you before we go any further. Over the next 20 minutes, the impromptu center committee picked Robert's brains over a wide a variety of issues. How committed are you to the Civil Rights Act, said Scoop. You agree that the state of health care in this country is disgraceful, asked Harrington. Don't you think this country could do more to protect the environment, asked Newberger. It almost felt like a college d debate club, but Robert answered all the questions thoroughly and enthusiastically. As the questioning came to a close, Robert spoke up. The Republican Democrats no longer represent this country, nor are they willing to do what is necessary for its people. I want to join you because I feel that you represent the change that I believe in and the change that my brother believed in. Scoop glanced sideways to his associates. Newberger nodded with a smile. Uh, Harrington paused and then gave a small nod in assent. Scoop being brightly, it would seem he had finally found the man he was looking for. Mr. Kennedy, how would you like to be president? And Kennedy crosses the aisle. Ah, oh, this is just it's so good. Oh, crap. A calamitous NPP campaign? No, 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 no. What? What? Who ran this campaign? Oh, the Great Plains are not looking good. Uh, at least uh, for the House. Uh, up here, though. Uh, uh, election primaries. Cool. The National Progressive Party Convention concluded today. Perhaps one of the greatest shocks in American political system since the unification of the Republican Democrats and the rise of the MPP itself. After multiple ballots with candidates representing each of the many factions within the party, including, including George Wallace, Michael Harrington, and Scoop Jackson, a clear winner emerged. Robert Francis Kennedy. How Bobby. Kennedy and the brother and chief of staff of former President JFK and the seventh of nine children of former President Joseph P. Kennedy and was President Nixon's campaign manager in 60 and who took the nation at storm with an explosive speech criticizing the party of his father and brother for failing to live up to the people became the standard bearer of the opposition party just four years later and still a shock that many are trying to come to terms with. Perhaps it was the sidelining of his brother as a scandal engulfed the White House, or perhaps to simply make a clean break from the corruption of the current administration, and of his own past to serve his nation. The true answer may be that Robert was infuriated with the President's vetoing of the Civil Rights Act, stalling, if not in ending the dream of equality for all races. The issue, which RFK has championed since he first got into politics, managed to obliterate his closest competitor, the segregationist Governor Wallace. In his victory speech, RFK made his support for civil rights adamant. We must recognize a few, the full human equality of all of our people before God, before the law, and in the councils of government. We must do this not because it is economically advantageous, though it is. Uh, not because of, of the laws God commanded, though although they do. Not because people in the other lands wish it so. We must do it for the single and fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. Already, RFK has great support across the nation, from African Americans seeking to end the terrorists of Jim Crow, blue-collar workers that see him as the strongest advocate, progressives wishing to make the U.S. a more equal society, and millions more that just want to banish the corrupt and dirty politics of Nixon to the history book as fast as possible. It just remains to be seen if this can translate into victory in November. Will RFK finally get the NPP into the White House? Well, hopefully. So we still got East Coast, Darylin, Darylin, that's kind of Darylin, Maryland, and Delaware, Southwest, but really the Great Plains, Great Plains, and yeah, Great Plains and East Coast, I and mean, that's pretty much it for me, because the House doesn't matter nearly as much, at least for this campaign. The House matters, somewhat, in real life, but still, whatever. Hmm, actually, how are you doing with building? Polls are updated? Oh, boy. Uh, I want I want to spend more time just building infrastructure for now instead of anything else, just because well I only want to build places that have like 100% uh, infrastructure. So a soul in torment, he was a crook. Will not go over well with the Southern Dixiecrats. A soul in torment. 
We're going to be saving it, Nixon's legacy, though. Because that is the way we need to go. Scandalous or no, President Nixon left us with a lot of baggage, intervening in the war in South Africa while an arguably honorable decision in the name of helping our allies has quickly become one of the most controversial moves in recent times. If we're to recover our reputation, we must find a way to salvage Nixon's decisions and turn his failures into a great success. War propaganda must be ramped up to further spin this war as our moral duty. Efforts must be taken to mitigate the bad press we accrue from the goings-on in the African bush. For every life lost or every man crippled is another stain on our reputation. Ultimately, efforts must be taken to eke out some sort of victory in Africa, even a moral one. South Africa is an affair brought about by the actions of the Republican Democrats and only by proving that it was a right decision can we prove that our loyalty to the President Nixon was not completely foolish. Cool. Uh, I do wonder, though. Let's go ahead and do Central East Coast. Eh, might as well. Can you... Oh, look at that. Well, Great Plains. Oh, that's, that's a house. Like I said, that's a house. Whatever. Um, can you actually keep Nixon in office? That's kind of interesting. Hmm. I wonder if you can or not. Strong leads, strong leads. Yeah, Great Plains. Other than that, Great Plains, East Coast, whatever. Uh, political landscape, anything here? American society is disunited, which will benefit presidential challenges and boost extremists. I love boosting the extremists. Anything else we really care about? Increased party unity. <laughs> the Republicans and Democrat parties willing to put their aside their differences for now. The National Progressive Party is working very well together, though. We'll repair everything else later on. Ooh, smuggle the English weapons. Um, some of the English, lots of weapons. A new genre arises. Very cool. <clears throat> A new genre arises. For American observers, the Adriatic Basin, with half of the abandoned villages molting, mottling dry plains and brush that roll for miles without end, sim strikes similar to the long-gone days of the old Wild West. <clears throat> Much like the frontier, Adriatica, Adriatica is rife with outlaws and constabularies. Constabularies. Saloons of sins and banks of marble, and poor settlers caught in the middle as they toll a miserable life out of sand streaked with blood and oil. Never in the present has there been such a depiction of this mythical age truer than Italy's youngest province. Italian filmmaker Sergio Leone demonstrated his awareness of such when he re released for a few dollars more late this year. Featuring up-and-coming Hollywood actor Clint Eastwood as a rough, tough, speaking mercenary, the movie brought new life to an old genre while introducing its own refreshing themes. Standoffs between lawmen and bandits and desolate mining towns were joined with ambitions about laconic bounty hunters and long-held grudges, tied together in a captivating plot centered around a heist. Though the film depicted America's Old West, <clears throat> a conflict it has shown resonated with the Italian pioneers seeking their fortunes in the country's new frontier. Despite less than stellar reception from film critics for its over-the-top violence and campy tone, the film nevertheless broke records by reaching $14 million to the film's gross revenue, proving that there is a place for the now-termed Spaghetti Western in the free world's silver screens. Already rumors about of a sequel, and directors and studios hint of filming their own reimaginations of a bygone era in the very much same savannas that evinced its stories in the hearts and minds of millions. Long shall the world remember Monkle's name. And we have some uh, research. Cool. Support weapons? Yes. You gotta be saving a legacy here, my friends. And we're gonna do the African gamble. No matter how one looks at it, the situation in South Africa is a mess. Through Nixon's misguided opportunism, our troops have been sent half a world away to fight and die in a conflict we barely even understand, and the people are understandably growing more and more angry. To back down now, however, would be an act of cowardice from which we would never recover. Instead, we will win back the people by winning the war. We must not win the war, but win it quickly. If we can minimize the amount of time America spends bogged down in this quagmire, we can score a great victory for the U.S. That we can ride all the way to the polls. President McCormick is already preparing to order American troops fighting in South Africa to seal themselves for an aggressive assault, aiming to cripple the boards of the Nazis as fast as possible. A bold plan which will require equally bold results, and if we fail to provide those results, the voters will never forgive us. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'll be honest, it really doesn't matter. So we're not going to win the war anyways because I've already, <laughs> I've already decided that we won't, we're not going to. Oh, you know what? Actually, let's come back down here. So this is basically like our Vietnam or something. So fine with me. Fine with me. There goes those guys. Anything around here? Eh, that's kind of okay. Upcoming race. Just keep it in mind. East Coast guys. Even Great Plains. Even Great Plains a little bit too. Uh, let's see. Upcoming Senate race. Oh, what? The domestic situation. Somewhat low. Actually, let's take a look at this. Oh, look at that. Oh, you know what? I love seeing this because you can see senators for each state. Such as... Oh. LBJ from Texas. I see anyone else here that we kind of know about. 
Ross Barnett, uh, Strom Thur Thurman, of course. Anyone else around here? R Albert Gore Sr. Al Gore Sr.? Oh boy. Uh, anyone else that we really kind of know? Uh, Archibald Cox, huh? Anyone else? Burns, William Burns. Oh, look, there's Barry Goldwater. Found him from Arizona. Uh, anything else? Philip Burton. No, there's Newberger from Oregon. Cool. So question, another question for President McCormick. I've addressed the nation again tonight to respond to the questions and inquiries of many Americans who are now seeking clarity and answers in regard to many of the most pressing issues regarding the U.S. While there are some debates that I cannot talk about as they're classified in order to protect the U.S., I will provide whatever information I can. Many letters mailed to the White House have touched on foreign affairs, and tonight I will address several of those issues. By far the most numerous letters, such as the one by Frank K. of Oakland, California, have to do with the Japanese occupied treaty ports in San Francisco and LA. I write to you tonight in regards to the treaty ports in California. It is a national disgrace that we have allowed Japan to control two of the most vital ports on our Pacific coast, strangling our trade throughout the world, even though not a single Nazi or Jap stepped on American soil at all during the war except as a prisoner of war. Why have we not reclaimed our rightful territory, or even tried to do so, since the end of the war? Has America become cowards in the face of imperialism and dictatorship? Will Frank and the hundreds of others that have written him, and thousands of more across the U.S. that are asking the same question, I will say, Japan will face our power in due time. Our alliance are with democracies in the name is the beginning of the end of the Japanese imperialism. They will face our power in due time. By God, they will. The African Gamble. Lightning Warfare. The war against the fascist menace is of critical importance, declared President McCormick to the assembled reporters. But so, too, are the lives of our men. We want nothing more than to bring our boys back home with, to be with their families again. That's why we're making efforts to bring this escapade to a swift conclusion as possibly as fast as possibly as we can. The conference was as long and grueling. While claims were made regarding the war, McCormick promised swift offensives and fluxes of support equipment, various dates by which Quag... Quellmaine and Luanda would surely be in American hands with many other bold suggestions. The reporters asked tough questions. What would this how would this affect the economy? Could the soldiers hope to cross such vast distances in such a short time? How would such an offensive act uh, affect the well-being of the men? The claims flowed freely, and the questions came back even firmer for what seemed like hours. Afterwards, McCormick found himself only able to hope that his words would sway the public back. A quick end to the war would not only free the party from the dignity of having declared it, but also allow them to ask the bask in the great victory over fascism that would arise from it. This, of course, rested on whether or not he or the armed forces could pull off such a victory. It had to work. It has to. Oh, well, it's not going to. Oh, we've only, we lost about 800 guys. That's not bad. And let's see. He was a crook. He was a soul in torment. The actions of former Nixon, President Nixon, were unacceptable, of course, but there are so many in the party who respect the man's policies, policies and platforms. A not insignificant portion of party bureaucrats have suggested that Nixon's actions should be formally pardoned and allowed to retire gracefully. Nixon's former allies argued that this would help us truly wash our hands of him and help stabilize the party in this cri critical moment. This would not be popular. But Nixon's voting base would approve, but pardoning his actions would certainly be condemned by many other people. Still, bringing Nixon's allies back into the fold would help bring the party together, and the stability of the Republican Democrats is paramount to our potential success. He's deeply unpopular, especially amongst the Northern Progressives. Oh well. Black PSYOPs in South Africa. In war, psychological operations are given. What is widely known as white psyops is seen in virtually every theater of war with the distribution of state-approved propaganda such as newspapers, posters, and leaflets among foreign populations and military, military ranks. What is lesser known, however, is what is known as black psyops. Throughout the Af South African War, Iberian psycho Psychological Warfare units have conducted black psychological operations in an attempt to dissuade, demoralize, and convince enemy forces and populations. Uh, these initial operations have seen some limited success, however, in conjunction with the Central Intelligence Agency of the U.S., they hope to expand the scope of their black psyops. The Americans have been proven... Uh, to be rather brutal yet effective in securing a strong hold over South African territory. In conjunction with the South African government and Iberian Psychological Operation Units, an operation has been undertaken known as Phoenix Program. This operation aims to conduct a covert psychological operation upon those in South Africa who may possibly lean to support the SHIELD or the Boers. Through exposure, public humiliation, arrest, or even torture, or humiliation, huh. The CIA and Iberians conduct a campaign of terror among the civilian populace who will lean in support of the enemy, aiming to neutralize the membership of the hostile organizations. This is just one of the many black psyops concocted by the CIA, from whom the Iberians have been taking ample notes. The agency is making headway. Oh, the CIA. Let's go and kill these guys off too. Let's get a little bit of action there. A solid MPP campaign. Great! And this was in the central Atlantic coast. So that's cool. Very nice, very nice. Just don't end the war too soon, guys. Do not end it too soon. Oh. Oh, they came back. Okay, bye-bye. Getting shipped off. Oh, let's go over here now. Mm, can't do that yet. That's fine. What actually can we do here? Uh, boom, do that. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
So, uh, we made some more military factories, which is actually really good, because we need to make more. There's Komi. Uh, yeah, we could go up to five here. We got plenty of transport helicopters for now. What else do we need? It's lagging a little bit here. Oh, boy. Uh, two, 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 two. We could use a few more APCs, but we already have those underway. Germany restores order over Central Europe. It seems that the old lion can still roar. Hmm. Improved jet cask CV, which we actually probably really, really need to get. Uh, jet fighters. Wait, do we have... There's jet cast, that's good. Cool. Uh, you know what, let's go ahead and start making some more factories here. Let's see, Indiana and Ohio. And Michigan. Oh, Royal, let's go to an Oberkommando Blauschitzstadt. Who are you? Adler. The polls are updated. Cool. cool. A soul in torment. Uh, let's see. Strong lead, small lead. A few R&Ds here, deep south. I'm gonna go back to the Rockies. And home by Christmas. More guns, more fuel, more marching. We can spare no expense if we were to keep our promise to end the war as soon as possible. Our boys on the ground will have to face a grueling long march into the depths of the darkest African nation or continent against the most horrific of foes, but the suffering will not be in vain. The faster we move, the faster our enemies will fall. And the faster they fall, the sooner we can get a great victory parade. The anti-war protests grow louder, but we must harden our resolve and strengthen our commitment. President McCormick is preparing to authorize a massive influx of supplies and equipment to the troops to keep them marching, fighting, winning. No price is too great for the victory to, with, that is within reach. Our boys will be home by Christmas. They must be. Let us not stop thinking about what they will happen to the party if they are not. Oh, you do not want to know what's going to happen. Because they are not going to make it to home by Christmas. Oh, they'll make it home by Christmas. 65. It's not home Christmas. 64. Because by the, because when I, actually, when I go and actually take these guys out, it's not that difficult, actually. Especially with, with, when we have air support. I wish I could speak better. I apologize about that for this episode. Just my speech. Right now, all over the place. Wow. Uh, anyways. Uh, yeah, but honestly, this is not that difficult. It's pretty easy. Someone said that if I didn't get involved, South Africa would have lost. Which I'm pretty sure they're right, just because South Africa doesn't seem that strong at all. But, uh, let's, go, let's keep doing this. Oh, we did that already. Oh, we, we're done with our land doctrine. Oh, that's fast. That's very fast. Cool. Uh, better, maybe better tanks? Because we do have a lot of tanks, so let's see. How far can we go? Look at that one. Multi layered steel ceramic composites. But yeah. The opposition's campaign. No, oh, well, whatever. South African War don't really care. Toss up, toss up. Let's see. 64 Tokyo Olympic Games comes to an end. Tokyo's left quite the impression. Looking pretty divided. Cooper, Hart, Swainson, Proxmire, Reynolds. John W. R Reynolds Jr., huh? Hickenlooper, huh? That's kind of cool. Is that? I always forget Vermont and New Hampshire screwed up. So Vermont is the one on the left, and New Hampshire is the one on the right. Okay, cool. And home by Christmas. Well, not really, but we'll try. The passing of the torch. President McCormick has done all he can with the little time he has. Uh, last, a few last-minute campaign speeches and fevered assaults on the opposition might sway the odd voter here and there, but by this point, most people's minds have been made up. As election night draws nigh, all we can do is sit back and hope that it was enough. Whatever happens, the White House must be ready to house its fourth president in two years. Preparations must be made for the transfer of power to the next commander-in-chief, and for the first time in over 100 years, that man may not bear an R or D next to his name. Whoever wins the election, we must make sure that the handover is as clean and orderly as possible, to ensure that the principles and traditions of democracy our nation was founded upon are upheld. The wait is nearly over. The polls are nearly finalized. It is almost time for this historic election season to come to an end. President McCormick and his closest advisors sit in the Oval Office. Fingers crossed, soon comes the moment of truth. Crunching numbers at dusk. In which we have... We're literally a day away. It's November 3rd, I think. Is that always election day? I don't know. But it's like, it's so close. The campaign. Well, we'll see what happens. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're starting... Class 1 Senate elections. After months of politicking, spending, debates, some speeches, and campaigns rising and failing and falling, the big night is here. Americans from every walk of life are gathered around radios, television sets, or street corners to hear the news. Will the candidate win? Will the opponent go down in defeat? What will be the big news story tomorrow? What newcomer will upset the incumbent? Or what damaged office holder will defy the odds and get another term? That and more will be announced tonight. Of course, while hundreds of races for mayors, governors, and representatives are important races in their own right, it's the Senate elections that most people are focused on. With the political upheaval from the Republican, Democrat, and the NPPP coalitions, the upper house of Congress has become the battleground for America's heart and ideals. The makeup of the Senate will soon be revealed to a waiting public. Shh, everyone be quiet. I can't hear the TV. Election Day. 
Across America today, tens of millions of people have lined up in churches, libraries, schools, and community centers to exercise their right to vote. In Dixville, Notch, and Hart's location, New Hampshire, excited old timers gathered in their town's ballot rooms at midnight so that they could be the first in the nation to vote. Throughout the day, pundits on all three major networks have speculated who will win or who will clinch the necessary electoral college majority to win the White House. Will it be the brash populist coalition of the MPP, or the stead and battle but still strong incumbents in the Republican Democratic Party? America has faced countless challenges these past several years, from political strife to bloody war. As the night goes on, Walter Crockett of CBS is the first to announce their projection. The winner of the 64th presidential election is... Let's see, the Republican Democrat Party received 101 electoral votes, while the National Progressive Party received 433 electoral votes. Robert F. Kennedy has won the election. There we go, my friends. We have done it. That's exactly what I wanted to see. And now it's time to win the war here. Let's go ahead and actually get involved in this godforsaken war. Jesus Christ, I want to end this thing. Well, well we won't win it by uh, Christmas Day, but we'll definitely buy it next year's. Because, honestly, with using it, helicopters, it's not that difficult. It's really, really, really not that difficult. The speed that these guys have. Oh, my goodness. They're just so good. Oh, send... Oh, I can send something to England. Uh, U.S. demand Germany to stop. Um, uh, okay. That's interesting. Oh, I could send stuff to them. Send volunteers? No, nah, I'm good. I don't really care. I'll be honest. I don't really care right now. Oh, look at, look at see it. Defended their seat. Republican Party lost his stuff. Oh, the upcoming race. Look at that. The Republican Party lost 12 seats. The Democrats only lost three. The MPP Center got 14, and the far right only got one. That's not bad. And you know what? It's only 20. I'm going to go ahead and increase OFN influence here. Increase by 1% every month. 6% every month. We'll do the best we can over there. Because I, I still want them under us. You know, I'd be not under us, but with us. Not under us. They're not under us. They're not sleeping with us. Wait, what? Oh, never mind. Uh, cool. Cool. Oh, they have helicopter boys, too. Not for long. There you go. Uh, you know, just help out. Don't even worry about that. Yeah, there you go. I mean, they're so fast, it doesn't even matter, so... Cool. Alright, let's capitulate this uh, guy. So you guys go here. You guys are going to go there. 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 We're going to send you guys to take just the, all the capital states. All the major cities. There you go. Look at that. Look how fast we go. The passing of the torch. Crunching numbers at dusk. McCormick has never seen so many numbers in his life. Right now, as the rest of the country headed out to the polls, cast their vote in what had become the most divisive election in living memory, all he could do was sit and examine the endless sheets of paper stacked on his desk. Newspapers, stat sheets, communiques from all across the country. The contents of the papers were varied, but in each of them he had circled the particular stats he was looking for the polls. The New York Times and the RD stood a good chance in Iowa, while the Boston Globe predicted a bloodbath in the NPP's favor. Posters in Illinois seemed confident that a Republican senator there would keep a seat, but the news from Louisiana was not so encouraging. Endlessly, McCormick gorged himself on poll numbers, feeling his heart sink at every poor showing and subsequently soar at every promising result. Yet he felt himself growing increasingly frustrated as the pollsters seemed incapable of agreeing with one another, and the final result remained as unclear as ever. The uncertainty made him feel sick to his stomach. He knew he hadn't always made the right choices, and the MPP were stronger now than they'd ever been before. Nixon and Kennedy were the reason he was in this mess, yet history would remember him as a man who made or broke the Republican Democrats. As the night wore on, the official about a vote counts began, McCormick felt his eyelids begin to droop. Resting his head upon a copy of the Washington Post, he felt his thoughts and, abs and fears ebb away. As sleep finally took him, he resigned himself to the knowledge that he would wake up to a brand new president, whoever that might be, sleep well, caretaker, president. Well, we kind of already know that uh, RFK is one, which is great for what we want. Really, really. See, look how easy, it's so easy to win. It's ridiculously easy. You know what? These guys could probably kill them off easily enough. I'm going to take out Leopoldville next. I'm going to completely ignore Ost Africa. I'm going straight for this big boy here because actually this one's a little, this one's actually pretty annoying uh, to take out because you have to basically set two one division on each way, one going north and one going uh, east. So if you didn't know, I've actually done this a little bit before with African Gamble. Cool. Let's get you guys up there. Okay, you're ready to go already. Uh, so we're going to take out Leopoldville, Brazzaville. Uh, just go ahead and come back down here to here because God, I love helicopters. You know what? I never used helicopters before this campaign before, but I'm going to definitely use them again because my goodness, helicopters are just ridiculously good. I love them so much now. Oh, thank goodness. You know what? That's kind of the nice thing about playing different nations with different technologies. Um, I think we still got that one. Like you learn things you normally w probably wouldn't learn if you didn't try out different things. So it's really cool. That should be enough to capitulate these guys. And I don't expect a lot of resistance at all up here, so. Look how fast. Look at how fast I'm going. That's beautiful. 
The fall of Leopoldville. The blow was heavy and the dagger was plunged deep. After a long string of defeats suffered by the Africa Shield, Leopoldville, the administrative center of the Rex Commissariat, has fallen into the hands of American led coalition. The news comes from as welcome development for the South Africans and their new allies, as it now means that a second front has been successfully established deep inside Deutsch Africa, crippling the German war effort and dramatically sinking their morale. The city now bordering the Congo Lake was poorly fortified, but its strong natural defenses in the form of quagmires and the ever-present jungle, which slowed down the attackers and severely limited the use of artillery and air support. In the end, however, they weren't necessary. The hastily erected defenses fell after only a short battle, as a mercenary garrison prepared to surrender in the face of the dramatic numerical superiority of the enemy. Now they wait to know their fate, as it is unclear whether they are actual soldiers or armed civilians. With the fall of Leopoldville, Centra Africa is on the brink of collapse, and the entire shield hangs precariously in the balance. Unless bold actions are taken and victory follows, the war will be lost, which is something exactly what their opponents hope. Perhaps the war is truly coming to an end this time, and yet the war continues to go on. We don't even have RFK yet, so before we end all of this African war stuff, we're going to leave these guys alive and get RFK in power so he can do a couple of his focuses first. Because this is this is not that difficult. Keep paying off the debt, because I know debt is but a number. And there's really no penalties for having too much... Well, not too much debt. But... Oh, Senate election results are in. Keep boosting up that civilian budget, because we love spending money. With the heady days of the campaigning behind, the dust begins to settle across the U.S. The votes have been tallied. Close races called. Victory and concession speeches given. Pulses are taken down. Buttons stashed in the drawers. And the population begins to return to a sense of normalcy. The incumbents who won their races return to their offices to get back to work, while those politicians that lost their races or declined to run last time are making their plans to back, pack up their papers and staff to return back to their homes and civilian lives. Idealistic newscomers of every ideological stripe are starting to ride high in victory at this sort of sort their affairs to make the move to the state capital or Washington. Those that lost return back to their old jobs and old lives, saddened and disappointed that they will not serve, but nevertheless proud of what they accomplished. But while the political machines of the RDs and MPP are shut down to go into hibernation, as the process of governing the country resumes, soon enough they will be turned on again, and a long, exhausting, exhilarating, and exuberant election cycle will begin anew. Whew, we've done America proud. Polls are updated. Cool. Uh-oh, the National Progressive Party has the most votes. Oh, actually, we're at, we're at 55. That's not bad. Uh, the Republican Party and well, the Republican Democratic Party are 43. 43 versus 55. And as you can tell, that's not... Let's see. 40, 30, 43, 55. We're missing two. But that's because Hawaii is occupied. So, uh, that's not bad. That's not, this is actually better results than what I got before when I played this by myself off screen. Uh, President election season is over. America has decided. The victory speech in the party winner has taken place, as did the summer concession speech of the defeated candidate. The last of the ballots have been counted and certified, and the election of 64 is over. The resident of the White House has been determined for the next four years, and that of Congress for the next two. While there's still the meeting of the Electoral College in December, and then the inauguration of January 20th to make everything official in the, for the history books, for many people, the new presidency begins now. If re-elected, the current president will just carry over with his regular duties. But if a new president has been selected, then the lame duck will hold the fort, issuing his pardons, work with the president-elect to ensure that the transfer power is smooth and un uneventful, and and it may be even beginning his life after ascending to the highest office in the American politics. The Daily News is now back to the regular crime scandal, foreign crisis, and fluff pieces that have been shunted to the side in the past few months. And soon the campaign will become a distant memory, only for, its, for historians and nostalgic staffers to look back on the future. After all, the work is underway already to prepare for the midterms. And four years from now, the whole thing will begin anew, unfortunately. Woo! All right, my apologies about that. Look how easy it is to capitulate these guys. We're, we're doing it too well, too easily. Union of South Africa is looking really nice. Maybe, and I'm sorry my, about that. Um, my cat came into my room and, uh, well, he wanted to sit down on my chair. So, uh, let's see. We're going to come back over here. I'm going to sit you guys right there. And we're going to wait until RFK gets in his office before we actually do anything. Right, Bink? Come on, buddy. Come on, right here. Binky, right here. Come on. Binky, right here. Come on. All right. Very good. How much are we building? One, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to seven. Awesome. Look at this. That's just... <laughs> this is so weird. Oh, they're still down here, huh? They still have the capital. Wow. They haven't even invaded down here. That's nice. That's very nice. And we could increase our influence. Oh, by minus 3%. Decrease pact influence. Jesus Christ. I mean, I could get really involved. Let's see. Well, we could try that. It's only 20 political power, so... But I do know we need to keep a lot of it, like I said before. Hey, Thatcher! How are you doing? Thatch Mama. I have played as Thatcher as England. As England, as Thatcher. Thatcher is a very interesting character in, uh, I guess in real life too, but most, in, especially in TNO, because she tries to privatize everything, and then in the end, she's like, seems like she gets a little paranoid about things, so. 
it was definitely a lot of fun playing as Thatcher. I will say that. A lot, a lot of fun, so. Happy January 1st, 1965, my friends. We can actually have some new, new technology we can do. Uh, I don't want to spend any more. I don't, I honestly don't really care about this. Yeah, you can have the Pact influence as much as possible, but that doesn't mean that you still cannot get England or Wales on your side. So, really, if you don't do this at all, you can still get, uh, the Kingdom of England on your side. It's really kind of random, even though they, they do tug a little bit more the other way, since I'm not doing anything here. Uh, authoritarian democracy, free market. I hope that they do visiting, old friend, so. Cool. Happy 65. And we have less than 120 billion in terms of deficit, or debt. Oh. Pinky just decided to sit down right there. Okay. Uh, more max factories in the state would be great. Steel ceramics stuff. Oh, Tennessee. I love Tennessee. I've been there once. Twice. I don't know. Uh, let's not do that one. Let's come back over here. Anything over here? Here's some air stuff. Why not? And... 24% minus 2%. Well, yeah. Oh, well. Support opens 4. 65, 66. Come down here. Nice. Cast is looking a little better. As you can tell, I'm not really getting involved here at all. I want to see... I want to see my new president. There's, a, there's nothing we can do. We got that. Yeah, there's nothing we can really do about this. You know, I'll come down here, though. Just to beat up people. I love beating up people. Inauguration Day, my friends. The American people have spoken. They want justice over nepotism and peace over chaos. By the powers granted to me by our holy constitution, I promise to legislate and implement an act that will unite America. No longer shall we be divided between black and white, man and woman. The America tomorrow will be of one. Each and every one of us will have to do our parts to bring our great nation into the future. God bless America. Robert F. Kennedy's speech was a testament to his late brother's legacy and his final project, implementing a law to stop segregation and dedicated his term to that cause. The question remains, will he be able to do it, though? Tensions in America is larger than in a long time, and his presidency is predicated on the cooperation with the far-right faction. Ardent segregationists are not known for its playing nice. Good luck, Kennedy. You'll need it. Hail to the chief. In which now we can be saving Africa. We can do charity for all. With malice towards none, the president's can't... Uh, Presidency, let's do Saving Africa because we can. The MPP didn't ask to have this hot potato of a war drop into our laps. Our administration would much rather focus on improving American lives at home and standing strong against the Japanese. Still, that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to end this war in America's terms. To confront fascism around the world, South Africa must be defended, and the Rex Commissars of Africa must be defeated. Alright, very soon we'll have these guys down here. RFK is elected. I like that megaphone. Cool. Let's get involved, boys. Time to bring home and smash the living hell out of these enemies. Uh, just go there first, and then go... Oh, you ran the divisions. Great. I'm just going to use these guys together just to smash the living hell out of, out of everyone at home. Uh, in Africa. Ooh, I like that. More war support? Yes, please. It's become abundantly clear that the RD lying and meddling has made this war more difficult to win. Victory in Africa has become secondary to the maintenance of an endless occupation to avoid humiliation, and as a result, our administration is quite uncertain about the actual state of the war. We need to immediately begin sending officials to South Africa to get the lay of the land and determine what our real options are. Guys, where are you going? Come over here. Mired in stalemate. The president has a bank of televisions in the Oval Office and a cabinet next to the Resolute Desk. It, it, it isn't for information. He has staffers and briefers by the dozens for that, but rather to feel the pulse of the nation. It is not healthy. On ABC, a camera crew embedded on the Ost African frontier comes under fire from three different directions. There is yelling, a rush to the helicopter, and screams of the wounded. On CBS, yet another campus building is occupied by a protester. Draft cards flicker like a voltive... Voltive candles in the early evening light as the nation's rebellious youth struggle under the pressures of the present age on NBC. A round table of intellectuals and politicians argue over that this war what this war means for America and for the world. They do this night after night, appealing to expertise when all else seems to be slipping away. In Washington, watching the death and pain and anger from the relative comfort of his office chair, the president puts his head in his hands. Gosh dang it, Nixon. God dang the R and D's. God dang every single one last of them put for burning America into this war, for throwing away all their hopes for peace. God dang them all. This must end. Yeah, the Progressive Party becomes a little bit more unified. That's cool. I'm actually going to send you guys over here. You might be able to cut them off a little bit faster from Elizabethville. There you go. Kill them off. Nice. And... A little bit of lag. Bingo was a Nemo. Cool. Alright, so let's go. just focus over here. It really doesn't matter at this point. So, you guys don't navally invade. Come right here. And we're just going to take everything. Now, their capital is actually down here, so which is fine. Uh, you are just going to go straight, take, uh, go there first. Take everything you can up north. 
That should be enough. You might need Kigali, Kigali, but whatever. I want you to go over here, to here, to here, in Africa. A fluid front. Uh, let's go do the pre Kennedy presidency. Election day has come and passed, and RFK is now the 36th president of the U.S. The new heir to one of America's greatest families that had blaze a cross-country campaign trail, promising to deliver equality for all Americans. To the worker, he promised better wages and better workspaces. To the old and infirm, he promised pensions for their hard work. To the sickly, he promised health care, robust and cheap. To the homeless, he promised homes of their own. To the colored man, he promised the rights that had been withheld for decades, that they can live freely and securely in the land of their birth. Though they have been subject to both doubt and ridicule from both his opponents and his own party, the results speak for themselves. President Kennedy has worked his has his work cut out for him in the months ahead. Cracks are starting to show on the NPP's united front, and the Republican Democrats from the country to state they have already been pledged to stonewall his legislation. But America is down trying to now look to him for deliverance, as he did once did to his brother. If Jack never quit, even in his final seconds, then neither will Bobby. Cool. As long as we can move swiftly and quickly, we shall do okay. Cool. Uh... I'm going to come back up here again. Africa Shield offers a ceasefire. Uh, our advance in the German colonies in Africa goes well. Indeed, if the missive the Germans sent us today is an indication, it is going far better than expected. The Reich sent us a communique indicating that it is amiable to a ceasefire, specifically one where the borders of South Africa are substantially larger than they were de facto before this conflict started. Whilst returning, refusing to withdraw from Angola, then Congo, or former British East Africa, this is a significant gain for the Organization of Free Nations if we decide to accept representing our commitment to protecting members of the Alliance and valor of our soldiers. Of course, this is no total victory, and some of the more ardent war hawks insist we should push further, but a substantial portion of the government are of the, are of the opinion that we should not bite off more than we can chew. In the end, it may be worth doing the ceasefire for what is the point of ruling the ashes of German domination, we're going to fight on. But I'm going to end ep today's episode there just because, well, it's gone on long enough. And we will finish this war probably in the early episode next time. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, guys. We have finally gotten Robert F. Kennedy into the presidency. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow when we finish off Africa and make it a bigger mess. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.